Good morning, everybody. How is everybody? I know it's not morning, but that's always my shtick when I come in and start my stuff. So I hope everybody's doing well today. I hope everybody's staying healthy. Uh, we got a really good one in the hopper for today. Today we're watching a 1957 classic. This one is called Red Nightmare. Uh, it was actually produced by the Department of the Army. Uh, well, it was paid for by the Department of the Army, and it was produced by Warner Brothers in 1957. It was originally supposed to be a training film uh, for soldiers going into the military to give them kind of ideological lessons in what they were fighting for and what they were fighting against and you know what was the what was at stake for them serving their country and really you know being the the tip of the spear and the the front lines against communism so again originally this was developed in 1957 it was intended to be shown to soldiers probably in, in some kind of you know in boot camp and basic training to give them, again, ideological background to, to make sure that they understood what it is that they were fighting against. Eventually, however, uh, it was originally first then broadcast uh, across the airwaves to, to the public in 1962. Uh, beyond that, then eventually it came to be shown in classrooms and, and all over the place in the United States because of its kind of ideological indoctrination. So this is definitely a propaganda film. However, I think it's, it's a really cool one uh, to take a look at and to engage with because it's it's first of all it was really widely seen it's a very famous film um but also there's a lot of really kind of interesting stuff to get out of it um in terms of what it shows and and how it communicates to us this message of anti-communism so without further ado i'm going to jump up here to the top of the screen and we're going to get started with red nightmare now kind of like i've been doing here in the past couple of live streams i will stop it uh, at various points and kind of make some commentary and kind of talk about what's going on and kind of what it represents and what it means um this one is a talkie unlike the last one so we do have you know not only narration but also verbal acting and so that's why i'm going to stop it because i can't really talk over um the 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 audio track of the the film itself so without any further hesitation let's start 1957's red nightmare soviet uniforms but american cars and also those look pretty like a, pretty much like american buildings in the background speak english comrade remember it's about the only freedom you do not have in this town. The only freedom you don't have. And one of the things that I really want you guys to pay attention to while we're watching through Red Nightmare today is there's a lot of kind of duality here. There's a lot of two sides of the same coin where they're, where they're really playing off of this idea of it's either this or it's that, right? There's this concept of dichotomy. There's the concept that it's either this or it's that, and the two versions of that are going to be to the very much extreme. So the first thing, of course, is the guy starts you know, on the left there, starts speaking in Russian. The other guy says, you know, speak in English. It's, it's the one thing you really can't do in this town is you can't speak in Russian, right? And so this idea of control and limitations versus freedom. That's a really, really, really key point. And it's a really key point when it comes to not only this piece of propaganda, but any piece of propaganda is that it's very, very important in a piece of propaganda to draw a diametric opposition, an absolute polar opposite between your side that you're trying to get people to believe and the other side that you're trying to convince people are absolutely, totally wrong. So this is, of course, no different, right? It's either you've got freedom or you don't have freedom. It's absolute control or absolute freedom, one side or the other. So again, it starts very simply, right? Comrade, make sure you're speaking English while we're in this town. American town. Americans, they have too many freedoms. 
right? And of course, now we've got not only is this is this a Soviet agent, but also, of course, he hates freedom. And he specifically and flat out says Americans, they have too many freedoms, right? He's he's in diametric opposition to this concept of freedom at all. And, and then, of course, he's critical of the United States for allowing and for affording Americans too many freedoms, which, again, is just it's this polar opposite kind of thing. That is another thing you must remember, comrade. For one day it will be your mission to destroy those bourgeois capitalist freedoms. So, a couple really important things there. One day, comrade, it's going to be your mission to destroy those bourgeois capitalist freedoms freedoms. So a couple things there. You'll hear you're going to hear the term bourgeois come up a lot. Bourgeois means upper middle class, right? The capitalist class, the investment class, that sort of thing. These would have been the people who were the owners of companies during the industrial revolution when communism sprang up. And so of course everything that's bad from the communist point of view is labeled as bourgeois, right? And and we kind of see this to some extent today, not that it's necessarily communist, but you see this whole kind of first world problems, criticism of people, right? They complain about something that's happened happening to them. And so people's reaction is, oh, well, first world problems, right? That's very bourgeois. That's very, you know, capitalist class of you. And, and so we see that here, that that's something that's been ingrained in the Soviet Union. Now, at the same time, that is something that communism as an ideology does focus on quite a bit is this kind of everything must be, you know, broken up into class divisions. There is the bourgeois class, which is the haves, which is the controllers and the owners of everything versus the proletariat, the workers, and how the bourgeois utilize the capitalist system in order to expand their own influence and power and dominance and control at the expense of the proletariat until, of course, what Marx tells us is the proletariat will eventually develop class consciousness. They'll realize their similarities. They'll rise up and seize control of the means of production overthrow the capitalists and then take direct control for themselves in the form of socialism, which would eventually lead to real communism. So that's what we've got so far, right? We're setting these diametric oppositions up between communism and capitalism, and we're showing that it's the Soviets themselves who are antagonistic towards freedom and capitalism and Americans. From all appearances, this community could be in Iowa, California, or Tennessee. Looks like an American town. So two things. Number one, this is Jack Webb. For those of you that are a little younger, uh, you probably have never seen Jack Webb before. But for those of you that are a little bit older, you probably recognize Jack Webb. Jack Webb is infamous in the acting scene uh, because, of course, he was one of the stars of an old show called Dragnet, where he played Joe Friday. Uh, you may have heard the phrase, just the facts, ma'am. That was his famous kind of one-liner from that, from that, where he didn't want interpretation. He didn't want to know how people were thinking about what your interpretation is, what you... Just give me the facts, ma'am. Just give me the facts. So he's kind of this staple, almost stock character of Americanism, right? He's he's definitely represent, you know, representative of in the 1950s. Uh, Hollywood definitely had a very uh, anti-communist faction within it, and he was absolutely a member of that. But he's showing us this. At the same time, uh, beyond just him being Jack Webb and being a big, you know, kind of a celebrity in the in the late fifties as well. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about this is they're kind of playing off of something that would have been familiar to people at the time. There's an old show called The Twilight Zone, and in The Twilight Zone, what they used to do is they would set up a, a an episode, and things would seem totally normal, and then there was always some strange thing, and that's what led to all the action in the film. And so a lot of The Twilight Zone was playing off of this concept of appearance versus reality, and how the appearance never really matched the reality, and that's why things were always a little off. Jack Webb here is definitely playing the role of the guy who used to be the host of, of the Twilight Zone, Rod Serling. He's he's setting that up so that this is supposed to very much resemble an episode of the Twilight Zone, right? So we've got, it's an American town, but there's Soviet soldiers. There's freedom, there's control, right? It's, it's again, this kind of a duality that this this particular film is trying to play up. So let's keep going. American is apple pie and ice cream. As a matter of fact, you can find apple pie here and ice cream too. But appearances are deceptive. This is not an American town. However, it may be assumed that such a town does exist, shrouded in secrecy and protected by utmost security. 
Now, this is an interesting one because we, we know things now that they didn't know back then. So one of the things that he says is it may be assumed that such a town really does exist. And he's implying that there are fake American towns behind the Iron Curtain in the Soviet-controlled part of Europe and maybe in the Soviet Union itself. And, and again, they're assuming that in the late 1950s because you know this is the high point of the Cold War. In point of fact, these were actually real things behind the Iron Curtain. And what, what I'm going to do is after the live stream, when this video posts, I'm going to come back in here and I'm going to leave links in uh, a card up here in the corner uh, so that you can click and see some, you know, some articles and some evidence that, that demonstrates that not only were these real things back in the 1950s, they're still real things now. Uh, in fact, there's an article here from 2010 of some Russian spies who were training and coming to the United States and learning in Russia how to behave like Americans and how American towns work and how suburban areas work and, and, and how to blend in and how to disappear so that nobody knows that you're secretly a covert agent of at this time, of course, it's the Soviet Union, but now it would be of, of Russia. They, these are real things. Um, and so, again, at the time in 57, they were assuming that this was true, that these that the Soviet Union was building these fake American towns to, to train their spies in how to interact with Americans and how to kind of blend in to the United States. So now we know that it's true. And again, I'll leave links uh, both in the description. And then when this video posts as a, as a video, uh, I'll leave it up there in a card. Behind the Iron Curtain. You might call this a college town, communist style, as part of a long-range plan to destroy our free way of life. These young communists are studying the economic, political, and religious institutions. So this video is going to focus on three things. Of course, they're going to focus on the young communists who who out of their ideological motivation, out of their love of communism and out of their devotion to the collective of the Soviet Union, these young communists are studying. They're doing the hard work, right? They're really putting their nose to the grindstone for the good of the collective. They're studying three things. They're studying economics, our system of the distribution of resources. They're studying politics. How does our politics work so that we can use that to subvert the system and overthrow it? They're also studying our religious institutions so that they can understand better what makes us tick, how we are able to you know, ex you know, exercise freedoms, what those freedoms are, how to even exert control over those institutions. That's what young communists are out there thinking about. That's what they're learning about, right? That's, that's the idea, right? And you think about American teenagers in the 50s, what are they doing? Well, they're building hot rods and going to the soda shop and, and that kind of thing. And here we see, again, the duality, right? In the Soviet Union's fake American town, their young communists are in a soda shop too, but they're there to study and they're there to understand and to learn how to subvert. That at the very heartbeat of America, the courses here in this strangest of all schools, espionage as a science. So first thing com young communists study, espionage as a science, how to be a spy. Propaganda as an art. Propaganda as an art, not that this isn't propaganda, but of course we're not going to admit that because since this is produced by the American military, this is the right side, right? This is the right perspective. But they study propaganda as a science, how to win over people's hearts and minds how to get them to agree with you, how to convince them to go with your particular perspective. That's the propaganda as an art. Sabotage as a business. Sabotage as a business, right? So their science, their art, their business is all about bringing down the United States. And again, it's all about, you know, you got, you've got to scare people. So you've got to create a boogeyman for them to be afraid of. And that's what this particular piece of propaganda is trying to accomplish. This nameless American city deep in the vastness of the Soviet Union. It stands as a symbol of Russian treachery, of long-range communist conspiracy. This town may appear to be an accurate likeness of a typical American community, but it's a fraud. It isn't free. Now, let's take a look at a genuine American town and a genuine American. I want you to meet Jerry Donovan. He's proud of his country but prone to take his liberties for granted. And he's aware that someone must assume responsibility for those liberties, for our free way of life. Yet, when there's a job to be done, Jerry, like so many Americans, is apt to ask, why me? 
So there's another duality that this film's really trying to convince people of, and that's really what makes it propaganda, is there's there's kind of two points of view here, right? There's the good and the bad, right? The good and the evil. There's the good of the United States and the American capitalist democracy system. There's the evil of the Soviet communist system, right? So that's the first duality that's being played up here. The second duality, though, is not necessarily between good and evil, but definitely, definitely between right and wrong. And so they're going to introduce us to Jerry Donovan. And Jerry Donovan is a patriotic American, right? He loves his country. But there's this, there's this rub. He enjoys the freedom. He loves the country. But whenever there's hard work to be done, right? Whenever there's responsibility to be taken, Jerry doesn't step up to the plate. Jerry assumes that it's going to be somebody else's job. And so the purpose of this particular film is, of course, to convince people not to be freeloaders, not to sit back and allow somebody else to, to take control and to, to preserve their way of life, right? You can't just sit back and enjoy the way of life and not do something to protect it. You've got to You've got to be personally responsible for securing your freedoms and your liberties. And so, you know, it's to get off the fence. The other thing I really like here is if you look at uh, dad and son playing catch back there, they're awfully close to that car. I mean, you slip just a little bit and the ball's going right through that windshield. In the 50s, I don't think they had safety glass. So probably not the best thing to do, but that, that kind of entertained me. Again, they even come out and tell you, right, it's the Department of Defense, Directorate for Armed Services, Information, and Education. Again, originally training film for the Army. Pretty soon it became something that was widespread to, to help try to, you know, keep people out of the, the lure of communism. A lot of these people are famous, the people from the 50s. A lot of them appeared on uh, on Dragnet or, or other really famous things at the time. But again, since most people anymore won't know who they are, uh, we'll, we'll kind of move on. So there's an interesting thing. The director of this, George Wagoner, apparently one of his signatures... Not that he did it every time, because he didn't do it every time, but one of his signatures in film direction was occasionally in his film credit, he would have all lowercase letters and then capitalize both of the G's in his last name. Nobody knows why he did this. It's just really weird to, to see that. Um, strange. <laughs> Also, I like the, and this is another link that I'll leave up here in the in the top corner. The music's by William Lava. Uh, some of my audience might not be old enough to remember this, but uh, I'll post a link to it up here. That that reminds me of a, of an old meme called Benny Lava. So, so I'll show you that one because I I really like to think about what would uh, how would this film be different if the music was actually by uh, Benny Lava. So there's there's another one, and again, watch for the links up there and in the description. Here you can see under the personal supervision of Jack L. Warner of the famous Warner Brothers production company, uh, Jack Warner was actually a major figure in um, the the hunting of communists inside of Hollywood uh, during you know the Red Threat and the McCarthy era and, and the Senate hearings and, and blacklisting and that kind of stuff. Jack Warner himself was actually very personally involved in all of that stuff. And of course here, He's involved in the production of the propaganda as well. Anybody home? Well, hi there, partner. What? Hey, what is this? You bad sight, people, we are late. What? It's on the warpath. You better send to the cavalry. So, of course, we start off with a somewhat uh, racially insensitive depiction of uh, Junior playing Indians. The other thing that struck me about this scene is when, when Jerry, this is Jerry Donovan, when Jerry Donovan comes home, he lives in a really big, really nice house. And, and I kind of went through and did some research because later on we're going to find out more about Jerry Donovan. Uh, he's a machinist in a, in a defense factory. And, and I thought that this house was maybe a little too big for a machinist. But then I did some research and I found out that 
in the 1950s, a machinist like him, it's a machinist uh, class A, would have made about three bucks an hour. Uh, if he was working 40 hours a week, that's $520 a month or $6,240 a year. If you convert that to $2020, that's about $54,334 a year. The average yearly income back then was only $4,000 a year, right? So if you look at it though, a brand new house in, in the 1950s, the late 1950s would have cost you $18,200 a year, which is about $158,000 in 2020. So I thought maybe this was a little much for Jerry to have uh, in this great big house and maybe they were kind of playing up the prosperity of America. But actually, I think that it's, it's actually relatively reasonable that a, that a person in his position would have lived in a house like that. Now you got this all wrong. You see, I have to be a good guy. Yeah. Yes. Hey, what are you doing? Get him running. It's not funny. Oh, and I just right, right, right. need the time to wash up. Then come and Right now. It's also not necessarily that they're being uh, racist against Native Americans at this time. It's just that in the late '50s and early '60s, the westerns were really, really, really popular. Uh, you know, just on television alone, they had you know Cheyenne and Gunsmoke and Maverick and Have Gun, Will Travel, Wagon Train, The Rifleman, Rawhide, uh, Bonanza was just getting started. The Virginian, all these classic western television shows were either in the middle of their run or were just getting started. So, so westerns were something that were very, very popular anyhow. And of course, John Wayne was making movies. Movies. And it's just a couple of years here before Clint Eastwood really got gets, got started in in you know spaghetti westerns and you know the good the bad and the ugly and that kind of thing. So we're talking about the height of the western stuff. So it's not that they're trying to necessarily slam Native Americans. It's just that was a popular motif at the time. Ah, so. Why are we eating dinner so early tonight, honey? Well, don't you remember, dear? You've got a union committee meeting tonight. So one of the things that's really important here is this kind of unity that's being presented when it comes to the United States. If you guys remember back to uh, another video that I did, which was Make Mine Freedom, right? We saw the kind of infighting between the different classes, between the governmental class and the bourgeoisie class or the capitalist class and the farmers and the workers and how everybody's kind of after each other. And that's how communism really gets its start is from this class conflict. Here, what we see is, you know, Jerry's, a, you know, doing really well. He's, he's a one income home and he's paying for a large family and a great house. It looks like they're living very comfortably, but he's also in a union, right? So it's not that unionism is bad. It's not that we're slamming American unions because, you know, they're somehow, because they talk about workers' rights, they're somehow, you know, influenced by the communist party. Although certainly sometimes they were, it's that Jerry is, you know, a union member just like anybody else. And that's totally and completely acceptable. It's not that kind of divisiveness within the United States that, that, you know, we would see in other times. I just want to make sure you could make it. Uh, yeah, that, well, uh, they don't expect me. I told them that your folks were coming here for dinner tonight. Oh, honey, Mom and Dad aren't due in for another week yet. Now you have plenty of time to eat, huh? Well, then you don't understand. I knew that your folks weren't going to be here tonight. So here again, we're playing off this duality, right? Jerry lives a comfortable lifestyle. He's doing great because of the American capitalist system. He's even a member of a union. But when it comes time to sit down and actually do the union work, he doesn't show up. Right? Not only does he not show up, he shirks his responsibilities and he lies to his other union members and says, oh, by the way, the in-laws are coming in, so I can't be available for the meeting tonight. And, and again, this kind of shirking of responsibility, taking advantage of the system while not contributing to the system when it comes to your participation, your direct responsibility. Mm -hmm. well, then why I just told that to the fellas to keep from going tonight. Oh. Besides, my favorite TV show is on. And again, what's he interested in? My favorite TV show is on, right? And remember, this is back in the days of broadcast television. If you don't watch your television show at 7 o'clock at night, you don't watch your television show because there's no reruns yet either. You want to admit that, would you? Would you? Well, Jerry, you missed the last meeting. Don't you think you should be there? I mean, nothing ever happens at those meetings. Oh. A bunch of guys sitting around listening to themselves talk. <coughs> now, the important thing that really has me worried no. What's for dinner tonight? Stew or hamburger? All right, so again, we see this kind of consumption-oriented mindset, right? The really important thing, honey, the thing that's worrying me right now is, what's for dinner? 
Is it stew or is it hamburger, right? Again, the, the kind of consumption-based mindset of I have to take care of myself and I have to provide myself with the entertainment of my favorite television show with, you know, what am I eating for dinner? That kind of stuff. That's what Jerry's focused on. Jerry is an exclusively a consumer, but Jerry doesn't have civic virtue or civic responsibility, right? And that's what this video is going to correct in him is it's going to inspire him with civic virtue. <laughs> Jerry, would you say that I was a nag? No more than average. Oh, well. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to be just this once. Why? Well, this morning, you told me that you wouldn't be able to make the PTA meeting next Wednesday, right? That is right. Old Mrs. Potter reminds me of a lovesick hippo. <laughs> besides, Wednesday's my bowling night. Oh, Jerry, can't you think of anything besides bowling and then television? So again, let's think about this, right? The wife has to establish, first of all, that she's not a nag, right? She's not just a person who's constantly after him to do things that aren't important. And he says, no, you're not any more nagging than, than average than anybody else is, right? So she's not a nag, so her criticisms are legitimate. Second, then, she says, you told me you couldn't go tonight because to the PTA meeting, right? The parent-teacher conference, you know, the parent-teacher uh, association, this, this, again, civic virtue, taking part in the local community's school district and, and helping to communicate with, you know, between parents and teachers and the schools and making sure that, you know, young people are being educated and, and that sort of thing. And and again, he goes, oh, I don't want to do that. That's just a drag. I don't want to go and see whatever her name was, right? I don't want to see them. It's it's a waste of my time. After all, I want to go bowling, right? So again, it's this kind of selfish, self-centered, consumerist mindset that this film is really attacking um, when it comes to establishing the bad guy outside of the country. But there's also this not quite so good guy inside of the United States, which is the freeloader, right? The guy who enjoys his freedom and takes advantage of the system, but then doesn't contribute and doesn't take personal responsibility for making sure that it's going to continue to be available to everybody else. Oh, well, you thought about that PTA, you think it was some kind of a hush-hush government meeting to, well, to determine the future of the nation. They can struggle along without me. Well, what about Jimmy's father-son banquet tomorrow night? He's been counting on that for weeks, you know. Well, now, that is different. I wouldn't miss that for the whole world. Besides, I wrote my speech already. Huh? Yeah, I've been rehearsing it all week. Do listen to this. <clears throat> um, members of Troop 28 are gathered here tonight uh, to discuss the ways and means of finding homes for Trooper Ryan 16 Collie Pops. How's that sound? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty bad. Yeah. No, I can give them a parting. All right. Okay. No, listen, just one more question. Just one. What about your reserves? You missed the last one, no, and you missed I the one. Well, honey, you did. So again, the last thing that she's going to nag him about, even though we've established that she's not a nag, the last thing she's going to nag him about is, what about your military reserve meeting tonight? Right? After, so, so for, for people who don't know, when you enlist in the military, you sign an eight-year contract, right? Even if your contract only says you're going to do four years of active duty, you are still on what is called inactive readiness reserve for four additional years beyond that. And you can even be called past that if, if it's really a national emergency. But generally what happens is you sign your eight-year contract, you do your two, three, four years in the military, you get out, you still have to attend you know, active reserve for a period of time, for a certain number of years after that. And Jerry, again, is shirking his responsibility. The nation's defense depends upon being able to call up prepared, ready reserves. And he says, oh, I don't want to go to the reserve meeting again tonight. You know, it's it's just, it's not something that's that's in my plan. I, I It's just not my problem. Somebody else will pick up the slack, right? Somebody else will pick up the baggage. Just, again, the problem of the freeloader. All right, I'll tell you what. I will talk to my secretary in the morning and find out if my schedule will permit me to go to the next one. Would you quit bugging me? Bill Martin, if you'll ask him to stay for dinner. Hey, that's good. I wanted to talk to Bill about how his team can beat State this year. Again? Well, he didn't listen to me last time. <laughs> So Bill is the uh, boyfriend of the older daughter of the family, and uh, Bill asked to stay for dinner tonight, and Mom said yes. And so that's good because Dad really wants to talk to him about the big football game and how uh, uh, these two are in college, and so how are they going to defeat the state uh, at the at the tournament this year for the football uh, tournament? Uh, Bill, 
So it's the play you've got to watch out for. Now, their quarterback takes the snap back. All right. His hands off the left half, who goes wide. Hey, Mom. So again, we get back to this kind of self-centered consumerist mindset, right? Dad's so consumed with talking about his kind of thesis that he's got going on about, you know, how to win this football game. He doesn't notice that his daughter and her boyfriend are like staring longingly into each other's eyes. And daughter's pouring coffee onto her strawberries like he's totally and completely oblivious, right? Everything's about him and his needs and his interests and what he wants to have happen. He, he's, he's irresponsible. He's just not paying attention to what's going on around him. And that's Jerry's fatal flaw, according to this film. Good night, beautiful. Good night, beautiful. Coffee on the straw? Oh, I never thought. Hey, go to bed. There's something on your mind. How can you tell? Hmm? I think a battle. Well, this is a play you've really got to look out for. All right, fellas. Half time. Sit up. Linda? Well? Anybody want to take a guess of what's going to happen next? If you do, Leave it in the comments down below. What do you think she's going to ask? Now, don't cheat, right? Leave it in my comments and tell me what you think is going to happen next because you probably can. Bill and I have given serious consideration to the situation, taking into account our ages and... Oh, Daddy, Mother, we want to get married. I'm sorry to see that so suddenly, Mother. I suppose it came as an awful surprise. Oh, that's really sweet. Congratulations, Bill, and I might add, you're a very lucky young man. Daddy? Well, everybody's through kissing each other. I now, Dad's just had this huge shock, right? His oldest daughter, his, his baby girl, now wants to get married to this guy who... F Two minutes ago, he was all nuts about because he's going to win the football game. Now, all of a sudden, things are going according, not according to Jerry's plan, right? Not everything is, is okay with him. And, and again, he's kind of hung up on this. So now, all of a sudden, Jerry feels this sense of responsibility, like, well, I better do something about this. But of course, everything else, when it comes to the nation, nah, not a big deal. When it comes to his daughter getting married... Now he's suddenly interested. And again, that's the kind of duality of when it's something that's important to you, you do something about it. When it's something that allows you to be worried about that kind of stuff, where are you? Where are you at the PTA? Where are you at the union meeting? Where are you at the uh, reserve meeting, right? Where are you, Jerry? Why aren't you taking responsibility for the nation that allows you your biggest problem to be? Your daughter who's in college wants to get married. I think there are a few things we ought to iron out. Now don't get me wrong. Bill, I like you, you know. I'm not against it. Matter of fact, I think it'd be a fine idea. Four or five years. In four or five years? You're both too young to get married right now. Mr. Donovan, I'm going to marry your daughter. And I'm not going to wait four or five years. Now, again, if we look at this, this I mean, this is a reasonably normal kind of a family thing to be going on, right? The young guy assert, you know, asserts himself and says, you know, I intend to marry your daughter. That's what I'm going to do. You know, dad puts his foot down and says, I don't think it's a good idea. Give it four or five years. Like, this is a relatively normal thing. All of these individual characters are doing things out of their own self-motivation. Like, this is pretty reasonably normal. But that's the problem. Good night, Bill. Bill. Linda. Honey, now let them go. Sweet dreams. So dad's all upset, right? Dad, dad, this, this, this has put him in a foul mood. He's, he's not, 
he's not happy with the world, right? His his perfect ideal situation is there's a there's a crack in the foundation of this, and so he says, "I'm going to bed," right? But now we get Jack Webb back, right? Our omniscient narrator is going to going to help him solve his problem and to make him a good and virtuous person. Picture of an American retiring for the night, going to bed in comfort, without worries or problems. Well, almost without problems. Linda and Bill may mean momentary worry, but in America there's always tomorrow with its bright promise. And problems will work out. Somehow things always work out. So that's an interesting one too. And a couple of things before we get into the next section of this of this film is first of all, there's this idea of American optimism, especially in the 50s. Right? In the 50s, we won World War II, we defeated fascism, you know, we, we saved the world, and so everything, you know, everything works out. Uh, the United States, the Americans are just the best people in the world, and the United States is the best place in the, in, in the world in the, that's ever been in the world. And so, of course, they call that American exceptionalism, right? In, in, in the United States, things just work out. That's just the way that it goes. After all, we won the World War. Um, Additionally, the other thing we have to recognize is the basis of that Americanism is individuality and individualism, right? This goes all the way back to the enlightenment of the 18th century and how it is the individual person that has responsibility, but also has rights and should be free to exercise those rights in whatever way that individual chooses. It's all about the individual and, and, and the freedom that that individual possesses when it comes to the enlightenment into the American system. However, when it comes to communism particularly, but even when it comes to socialism or any form of Marxism, what's important is the basic underlying understanding of the world is different. It's not, you don't start your analysis with are individuals free to do things. You start your analysis with is everybody equal? And so Marxism in general, but communism most especially, hypothesizes that if only we engineered society the right way, if only we make the government have the right form, if only we make the economy work the right way, if only we tax at just the right amount for just the right things, if only we have a certain level of control over what happens inside the system, we will be able to achieve the end goal of equality for everybody. The enlightenment idea, of course, is that equality comes from the opportunity to do something, but it doesn't necessarily mean everybody ends up in the same place. Communism works the opposite way. It's an ends-based system, and so we have to force everyone to end up in the same place regardless of how we get there. That's the basic underlying dynamics between capitalism and the enlightenment kind of philosophy and communism. And so now we're going to see, right, because Jerry is living in this individualistic freedom-based enlightenment system, but is taking it for granted and is not doing all that he can to protect it and to preserve it. Now we have to kind of snap him out of that and inspire him with some civic virtue. And the way we're going to do that is by giving him a red nightmare. Now in a few minutes, Jerry Donovan will be asleep. But tonight, instead of the sweet dreams his wife wished him, Let's give Jerry a nightmare, a real red nightmare. Now, you remember that Russian town we saw earlier, the town that looked like it belonged in Kansas or Ohio or Vermont? Let's lift that town out of the Soviet Union. Let's superimpose it on Jerry's hometown. And those precious freedoms Jerry so complacently accepts. Let's see how many freedoms Jerry might lose if suddenly he had to live under communist domination. So again, we go with this appearance versus reality, right? Let's give him a bad dream. So don't worry, this isn't really happening. It's a bad dream. But we're going to show him what happens if he actually lives in a real Soviet system. If he allows himself to be so complacent that the communists eventually take over, what's that really going to cost him, right? Let's show him. Let's take away the, the appearance and let's give him the reality. Now, that's important for another reason, too. And, and I'll give it to you this way. In the 1920s and the 1930s, Joseph Stalin dominated the Soviet Union. He made it into a complete totalitarian dictatorship. And one of the reasons that it's important that it was a totalitarian dictatorship was he controlled everything, including information 
He controlled every printing press and every radio station and eventually every television station, all of the schools, everything, right? He controlled all of the information and he also controlled all of the information that was leaving the Soviet Union about the Soviet Union. There were very, 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 very few reports and it was very difficult to confirm anything. So people were kind of left with the only option of, well, we kind of have to believe what Stalin is telling us and what he's showing us. And Stalin deliberately created an entire style of art which is called socialist realism, which specifically shows how great things in the Soviet Union are. And a lot of people believed it because, of course, there was no other option. Because of that, in the 1920s, in the 1930s, in the Western countries of Europe and even in the United States, a lot of people joined the Communist Party because they believed in the kind of propaganda that Stalin's state was crap it was you know cranking out and when they didn't have an alternative point of view they believed it and said communism is the wave of the future right communism is this highly developed sophisticated thing that allows for real equality you know among people and it's just it's a much better system than all of this fighting and competition and capitalism the problem is they didn't understand what it really cost in the Soviet Union. They didn't understand that Stalin was going to kill 30 million of his own people, right? Just to create this communist utopia. They didn't realize that he was going to send people to state farms where they were going to starve to death or that he was going to eradicate, you know, Ukrainians because they didn't want to share their grain, at least he thought. And he was going to wipe out an entire class of Soviet people called the Kulaks, right? 12 million of them at least, just because he felt like they were a lingering capitalist influence. People didn't know about that outside the Soviet Union. During World War II and then after World War II, one of the things the United States found out was, oh my goodness, the Soviet Union isn't really the way we thought it was, right? Things in the Soviet Union are actually really rough and people are really suffering horrifically. And one of the ways we found that out was Soviet soldiers would surrender to American GIs and they would say, please take me to prison camp. And we're like, but you're Russian. We're working together. And they say, please don't make us go back to the Soviet Union. Take us to a prison camp. We would rather be in your prison camp than go back to Stalin's Soviet Union. And we'd say, get out of here. You're our ally. And so they'd go put on German uniforms and come back and surrender and say, you know, with a fake German accent, hey, we surrender. Please take us to prison camp because we don't want to go back to the Soviet Union. When that kind of stuff started to get out and when people really started to find out what the Soviet Union was and how it really worked, that started this kind of backlash. And that started things like the propaganda machine in the United States to, to you know, snap people into the, the, the realization of what communism was really like in the Soviet Union and, and how it really worked. And then, of course, later on in, in communist China and, and, you know, all over the, you know, the rest of the place, wherever communism has been tried, it's been, you know, pretty much consistent results of massive starvation, eradication of people who are not ideologically pure and just disaster. So, you know, to, to that end, this is the wake up call, right? We're going to put Jerry into a nightmare so that everybody else wakes up and realizes how big a threat this is and does, you know, does their civic virtue and takes social responsibility for preserving the American way of life. That's how this is supposed to work, right? So let's, let's keep going. Okay, so Jerry's at the coffee shop, right? He's downtown, he's in his hometown, but it's, it's something's not right. He's a little discombobulated, right? And we all had that in a dream, but he's sitting there having his coffee and then you know, he's, he's starting to pick up, you know, on, on, you know, he's been living in the appearance. He's been living in the facade. He's been believing Stalin's messages, but now he's got to deal with the reality. Jerry's a little confused. Things seem different now, and they should, because freedom has suddenly vanished. Permit number, please. Permit number? Fred, I don't have a permit. I just want to call my house. I want to talk to my wife. No personal calls are allowed without a permit from the commissar. So this is a real thing, right? Uh, to, to use a, a telephone, you had to have a permit, and that permit had to be granted to you by the local political officer. The local official of the Communist Party had to say, here's your 
telephone license number. So if you want to make a personal telephone call, you can. If you don't have that license, you can't make that telephone call, right? Because ultimately it's the people's phone lines and the people only want the you know important people to be making calls on behalf of the people. You don't get to use those phone lines for whatever you feel like. Um, there's a really great example of this in Romania under communism, where if you were wealthy enough to own a car, it wasn't just your car. You had to make sure that you were taking care of everybody else too. And so one of the things they would do is let's say, let's just say, for example, your license plate was an even number. That means you got to use your car on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. On Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, somebody else better be using it because if they catch you in your own car, you get a ticket and they might even impound your car. Your car that you paid for, you're not allowed to use it because it's about government control to provide for all, to provide for the collective, to provide for the entire state, right? And here we see we see a really classic example of that. You've got to have a permit to make a personal telephone call, and that permit will be issued by the local government official who represents the Communist Party, because the Communist Party and the government are the same thing. Get off the line, please. Operator. So even the local soda jerk, right, is totally ideologically bought into this system, right? They hears the air raid sirens go off, the commissar wants to give an address, and even the soda jerk goes, come on, comrade, let's go, because now we're all equal and we're all together. Except they're riding around in an old American Willie Jeep. Now that you become acquainted with the enlightened communist system, in contrast to the outdated capitalistic way of life, you are now prepared for the next step of your indoctrination. So a couple things there. Number one, they, the, you know, the American propaganda is showing that the communists believe that their system is more enlightened than capitalism is. Right. And that capitalism is the old fashioned way of doing things. And he says, now that you've been in, you know, introduced to to the more modern way of living in this communist system, we're ready to for we're ready for part two. Right. We're ready to take this to the next logical step, which will be most difficult. When the moral fiber of the United States weakens and the economy collapses under the pressure of competitive coexistence, you will assume control. When the moral fiber weakens and the economy collapses under the competitive existence, right? The competition is what's so bad. It causes people to do bad things to each other and it causes chaos and disorder. And that's why ca capitalism is bad because in a competition, somebody has to win and somebody has to lose. And so what about the losers? We don't want them to feel bad. So let's make sure that everybody is the same and then nobody ever has to feel bad, right? So now the idea is, right, now that we've introduced you, now that we've kind of infiltrated your minds and introduced you to this communist system, you've got to be ready because when the opportunity strikes, you need to rise up and spread this communist system to the rest of the United States, right? These are the agents that Americans believed were here. And of course, later on, we found out they really were. They were infiltrated lots of different places um, not to the extent that people like Joseph McCarthy thought but but they were definitely here there were definitely people here there were spies here and they were people who were prepared to to be the vanguard of this new communist movement you will move into every phase of American political and economic life it will be your responsibility comrades to purge the minds of the reactionary Americans that's important too, because he says it will be your responsibility as the true believers in our in our you know good wholesome communist system. It'll be your responsibility to purge the minds, the reactionary Americans' minds, because remember, communism is based on thought. If you think of yourself as an individual and worthy of individual rights, you're a problem, and you're a problem that's got to be dealt with. Right. And so we have to fix people's way of thinking. And, and Marx himself actually wrote that the difference between socialism and, ca and real communism, Marx's communism, is when people stop thinking about themselves as individuals, when people only think of themselves as a collective, all problems will go away. In fact, Marx literally wrote that human history 
because it is a, a history of class struggle. Once people, once we kill the id, once we stop thinking of ourselves as individuals, human history will end because there will be no more struggle, there will be no more change, and there will be no more need to do anything different. This is the end phase, right? This is the end game of all human history is to get us to a point where competition can end so we can all celebrate into the future forever. To do that, it takes fixing the minds of the people. What's in here is really important. And if what's in here is wrong, then that's a crime. And of course, thought crime is something that people like Orwell really examined, right? If you're not thinking right, you're a problem because you're broken and we have to fix you for the good of society and for the good of all. So that they will welcome the enlightened Soviet system and conform without resistance to the dictatorship of the proletariat. Again, my congratulations, comrades. Continue the good work. So Jerry's looking around going, what the hell happened and how long was I asleep? Like, this is really crazy because I can't believe everybody else has bought into this. But remember, Red Nightmare, it'll be okay. Say, could you tell me what? Yes, comrade. Nothing. Nothing, never mind. So he goes home, right? How, how can home possibly be goofed up? Even if the rest of the town has been taken over by communists, home is still, you know, where the heart is, home is still the basis of everything. The family unit is indissolvable, right? Except for a communist, it's not. Because for communism, even the family, even the household is a distinction. It's a separation. It's a way that we can draw distinctions and, and, and groups between people, which then invariably leads to conflict. And so even, you know, for communists, it's really, really important that families also be very tightly controlled because you want children to be loyal to the state rather than to their parents because parents of course have all kinds of hang-ups that that put children into different categories right rich parents poor parents black parents white parents whatever kind of parents you want to talk about that creates division within the people and communism wants to impose uniformity of thought so children of course have to be raised to be uniform and identical in a, in a member of the collective and, and and so families are very dangerous and because they're dangerous they also require a great deal of control God, thank God you're all right. I have something to do. So the older daughter, dad gets home and she's obviously ticked off. He thinks it's probably, you know, still because of the marriage thing from the night before. She gets up and walks away when he walks in because she's mad at him, but not for the ma marriage thing. Gee, Helen, I'm sorry, I'm late. Something strange happened. Something very strange. I was standing in the closet. Um, never mind that. But you are disturbing your children. Their meals have to be consumed without corruption. I don't blame you for being sore. So mom is very regimented, right? Their meals are to be consumed without interruption. You're disrupting the kind of normal flow. We don't have time for your feelings and your individual problems, dad. It's time for the children to eat. And, and again, everything is very kind of sterile and institutional. And, and again, that's, that's what we generally tended to see inside the Soviet Union, right? It's, well, it's not a people problem. It's here's the solution, do it now, period. Sterile, institutional, person with a clipboard, right, saying here's what you're gonna do. But I'll make it up to you. Tomorrow night we'll have an early dinner at the steakhouse. Get the kids to drive in moving. That would be quite impossible. Tomorrow night you've been selected to address the parents' teachers committee. So he says, tomorrow we'll go to the steakhouse, we'll go to the movies, we'll do our own thing, we'll enjoy our way. And she says, well, that would, that's impossible. You've been selected to speak at the PTA meeting. What? <laughs> no, there must be some mistake. They don't want me. What would I talk about? Now, Jimmy's team lost the Little League championship last year. Subject of your address has already been selected for you. Ah, there's another one, right? You've been selected to address the PTA. And Dad says, well, what am I going to talk about? I don't have anything to say. Mom gives him the answer. You're there to speak. You're not there to decide what to say. The state will give you, right? The government's going to give you a speech, and you will read that speech. You are there to reinforce the message of the party and the message of the state. You're not there to give your own opinions because you're not supposed to have opinions. It's for the good of all. It's not the individual. The individual must be sacrificed for the good of the whole. That's the basic and underlying tension, right? And again, I keep coming back to it, but the Enlightenment era and the individualism of the Enlightenment era versus communism 
and group and you know the group dynamic and collectivism. That's what's really at work here. Thing will be how the new communist life the children. Wait a minute. What if I don't want to talk about that? What if I don't want to talk at all? I would advise you not to object. Recently, the party learned that you were on the debate team while in school. They were very disturbed that you kept this back a secret from so, first of all, you're going to tell everybody at the PTA how good the communist system is for children. He goes, well, what if I don't believe that? And she says, you better read it anyhow, because the party has learned you were in the debate team in, in school and you didn't tell them that. Why does anybody care about being on the debate team? It's because being on the debate team teaches you how to think and how to argue and how to analyze points of view. And if you can do that individually, that means you're not just completely and totally accepting what the party line is. And that's dangerous, right? Thinking is dangerous because communism is about thought crime and communism is about maintaining control over the minds of the people. So people who are able to freely analyze and think like that, they're a major danger. And you've got to make sure that you control that. So when he conceals that he's on the debate team in high school, they think he's up to something, right? They think that he's subversive. Experience speakers are needed by the party. They'll make very good use of What is this? Where do you think you're going? We have no time for explanations. Already we are 15 minutes behind schedule. I don't care who sent your wife. You're not going to take another step until I see your warrant. Warrant? We need no warrant. As a member of the Young Communist League, your daughter has volunteered for farm work. So dad immediately responds in, in the individual rights kind of way by saying, this is my house. You need a warrant to come in here. I'm defending what is rightfully mine. But of course, in a communist system, it's not about what is yours. It's not about, you know, your individual rights and control over your property. It's about the state. The state has need of something. The state has need of and, and it has ownership and control over what you are living in and what you have and what you control. They can use it and do whatever they want to with it, whenever they want. Be transported immediately. The truck is waiting outside. Wait a minute, let me get something straight. You say my daughter volunteered? That is correct. Here's the signature. Requesting transport to the People's Collective. So the older daughter has requested to go to the state farm. To, to leave her home and to go to work on a state collective farm for the good of the people, right? Now, if you heard that, most people would say, my, my kid wouldn't do that, and that's what Jerry's going to do, too. They can turn that piece of paper is false. And everything you've said is a lie because my daughter would never leave here of her own free will. Sergeant! You've got no right to be in this house. I'm going to give you just 10 seconds to get out of here. Daddy? It's true, Daddy. I did volunteer for farm work. Why? The party convinced me that I should free myself as a lingering bourgeois influence of family life. So the party convinced me that I should free myself from the lingering bourgeois influence of family life, right? Because I'm your daughter, I have this familial relationship with you. I think of myself as not part of the collective, but as part of the family. And so going to work on a state farm is going to be good for me. The, the party convinced me that my family's holding me back. My devotion, my dedication should be to the state. And that's a very, very, very big one. It's, it's no joke. And, and again, when it comes to people like the Red Guards. And what's really weird about this is this was made in 1957. The Red Guards in China weren't until the 1960s, but this is exactly what happened under Chairman Mao in China. I'm ready. Do not interfere. It is for my own good. Then Comrade Donovan. Do not think that your deviationist remarks shall be overlooked. It will be reported to the proper authorities. So now Dad's at work in a defense contractor. And so he's a machinist, right? He operates a machine and he makes, you know, parts and equipment and things like that. But then behind there, and of course he used to be in a union, right? The union protects the workers. The union negotiates with management and says, here's how many things our guys can produce in a day. Uh, but now what you can see is there's a quota posted, right? You will produce 60 units of whatever it is they're making every single day. And you will do that because now your union is controlled by the party. And 
doesn't matter. If you can't make 60 units, you better make 60 units today. Well, if that means that they're not going to be any good, you better make 60 units today because you're not going to admit that they're no good, right? What happens if you get a hold of that product, right? And you're, you're machining something out of steel, you get it out of steel and the steel's garbage. What are you going to do? Say, well, I can't do it. You can't do it. You're the problem. And you're going to the re-education camp, right? So again, it's this, it's this loss of freedom of individual control over your own production at work. Hey, what's this quarter bit? Today's work, comrade. Hello, Pete. Having a little trouble, Bertha doesn't seem to be in a working mood. The lake must be fixed immediately. You have a quarter to fulfill. You fail, we'll all be held responsible. I'm doing the best I can. Quarter or no quarter, I can't do anything till I get this fixed. Well, then I advise you work during your lunch hour. The quarter must be met. Comrade Commissar isn't interested in excuses. Right. And again, so this, this idea of individual sacrifice, you better sacrifice your lunch hour. You better get that fixed because it's, it's not about you and it's not about your individual problems. It's about the needs of the, of the collective. It's about the needs of what the commissar has laid down that we must accomplish. You are sacrificable. So you better get it done. Yeah, I overslept. The kids get off to Sunday school. All right. Well, it's a beautiful day. So dad asks if the kids get off to Sunday school, all right, and they're upstairs packing. If they get back from Sunday school, why don't we all pile into the car and go over? Hey, what is this? Someone going on a trip? You could call it a trip, actually. The children are going away to a state school. So now she's sending the children away to a state school because she's worried about the, the deleterious impact that dad's going to have on them because he's talking crazy talk about doing what he wants to do instead of what the, the, the state needs from him, exercising his own individualized free will rather than doing what is in the best interests of all. Now wait a minute. Wait just a minute. I don't know what's happened to you or what they've done to change you, but you're not going to send these kids away. Oh, she's not sending us away. It was our idea. We learned in school that home life does not encourage the growth of the collective character which the party wishes to develop in its young people. And again, controlling the young, that was really important because when you get them when they're young, I mean, this is something that the communists not only developed themselves, but also learned even more from Hitler and Mussolini is if you control them when they're young, you've got them forever and they will never, ever, ever, ever dare to question, right? So you tell them that they're bad and there's something wrong with them and that the way that they were raised is bad. And so the state's got to fix you by making you, you know, selfless and making you feel bad about the way you were, you are and were born and what you are and how you work. And, but the state's going to fix you. So just give all of your decision-making power over to us. It's your fault. You should have spent more time training us to think along party lines. As a member of the Young Pioneers, it will be my duty to report you. You better listen to me. All of you. I don't want to hear any more talk about state schools and party lines and collective character and deviationism. It's going to be a family again, and I know just where to start. You two are going to Sunday school, and you're going right now. My camera! No use to argue. Mama! This time, Mama. I'm going to overrule the party. So again, dad now, right? In the truest of the enlightenment sense, he says, I don't care what the institution says. I'm the individual. I know what's best for my own children. I made them. I can fix them. I'm overruling the party and I'm taking you to Sunday school. But of course, the whole concept of a religious institution is completely opposite that of communism because for communism, the number one overarching most important thing is the state. Your dedication, devotion, and loyalty belongs to the state. It doesn't belong to a god. It doesn't belong to a church or a priest or a religious figure or a rabbi or you know an imam or anybody else. It belongs to the state and the state really is first and foremost in everything. So religious institutions are ultimately a distraction and, and a way of dividing people, right? Uh, Marx himself wrote that religion is a tool of the bourgeoisie to split up the proletariat and to make it fight with each other so that they'll never develop class consciousness and launch a revolution. So of course, one of the important things in, in communist states is state imposed atheism where religion is specifically, maybe not outlawed always, uh, but definitely discouraged. Long enough. Now you're really going to find out what the truth is all about. 
So he goes to the church, but the church isn't a church anymore. Now it's the People's Museum, and it's going to showcase the exhibit of Soviet inventions in the old church building. We tried to tell you, Jack, but you wouldn't listen. There is no more Sunday school. Please take us home now, Daddy. Everybody's looking at us. Mistake. Somebody made a big mistake. Come on, we're going to get this straight now, right now. Come on. We go back to the inversion too, right? Because under normal circumstances, you would think about a person who doesn't make individual decisions and just goes along with what the collective thinks. You would think that that was the the strange part, but now everybody else is looking at him. Like, why, why is he thinking as an individual? Why is he doing what he wants to do? Why is he challenging the party? Why is he going into the old church? This doesn't make sense, right? But again, that's the twilight aspect of it is that him being relatively normal is, is now, right? There's something wrong with him for being normal. Come on, Jimmy. What's happened? What have they done? Keep your voice down, comrade. Otherwise, I shall have to report you. Who put these displays in here? This is a house of worship. You are mistaken. This is the People's Museum. I'm pretty sure they designed him specifically to look like Joseph Stalin. Um, his hair isn't quite right. Stalin had great hair, but uh, I'm pretty sure that's what they're going for here. And I warn you once more, this place is a lie. Everything about it is false. This, this was not invented by a Russian. The man's name was Bell Alexander Graham Bell. Right, so again, this is about the control of information, right? Once we take over the United States, the Communist Party will just rewrite the history books and teach it in schools, and no one will ever know any different because we'll say that a, a, a Soviet comrade invented the telephone, not Alexander Graham Bell. Right? And he certainly didn't do it to make money off of it. He did it for the good of all. Right, And when we rewrite the history books, that's what everybody will learn, and that's what everybody will know, and then we'll make a museum about it so that everybody does know that. Right, It's, again, this control of information. I think that's why they made him look like Stalin was because that was what gave Stalin more power than anything else was his control over information. And he was an American. Get that, comrade. Everything on this table is as phony as the town. The rock system you call communism. So now Dad goes a little nutty. Comrade Donovan, you are accused of the following crimes against the state, subversion, deviationism, and treason. You've been given this opportunity to make a public confession of your treacherous violations. So they're, they're, they're telling him, first of all, that you've been accused of subverting our system. Deviationism, and what that means is failure to conform, right? Failure to conform is a crime under this type of Soviet you know, dictatorship. Also, if you'll notice, this isn't a court. He isn't being accused of something that the state now has to prove, right? When it comes to an individual system of justice, all individuals are assumed to be innocent unless the state can prove otherwise. Here... When it's, a, when it's a communal system of justice, when the state accuses you, you are guilty, and you now have the opportunity to do the state a favor and to confess so that we can make an example out of you. You can say, I'm really, really sorry. The state gets to point out to everybody else that, look, we found a bad guy. We told you they were out there, right? You get a lighter sentence because you confessed and saved the state some time and some problems. And then we move on to the next thing. And, and of course, it's all, it's all a complete perversion of justice. None of this is about justice. It's how do you plead guilty or guilty, sir? Just a minute. This is supposed to be a trial. Who says I'm guilty of anything? Where's your proof? The state needs no proof. It is up to you to prove your innocence. Right. And again, the state needs no proof when the state mechanism, when the state institution has decided you are guilty, there is a reason for that. Your responsibility now is to prove that the state is wrong. And of course, you're never going to be able to do that because the state has to have self-referential power. They're never going to admit that they're wrong ever. How can I prove my innocence if I don't know what I'm accused of? Subversion against whom? Deviationism from what? Treason against what government? The prisoner has been given his opportunity to confess. I ask now that he be sentenced. Now, wait a minute. All right, and so again, we, we skip the trial because there is no trial. The state mechanism found you guilty already. That's why you're here. 
You had a chance to confess. You didn't take it. You're guilty. Move on to sentence. You, you've got to listen to me. They say I'm guilty of crimes against the state, but it's the state that committed the crime. And they broke into my home without a warrant. Armed soldiers. He took away my daughter. They created a house of worship, a place for religious objects with phony displays. They called it a museum. They even tried to turn my own kids against me. So again, the basic understanding here is Jerry's an individual. He believes he has individual rights. The state operates according to the idea of collectivization. They believe that they have collective rights, and those two things are, you know, incompatible with one another. He's accusing the state of wrongdoing for violating his enlightenment idea, not enlightened necessarily, but the enlightenment idea of individualism. They're blaming him for violation of the collective. And so again, they're, they're completely and totally incompatible systems. There's just, you know, deviationism is a crime. You deviated from what we told you you're supposed to do. And you now are the sacrificable piece of this puzzle puzzle. I why? Ellen, you were there. You know that what I'm saying is true. Tell them. And, and again, here we go. He's, he's relying on, you know, his, his wife. Right, the the person who legally is supposed to be him, you know, they're too legally they're the same person, you know. If anybody, you should be able to count on your your spouse. But communism says all devotion is to the state, not to your spouse, not to anybody else. It's you and the state. The state is your god, and so of course her loyalty, since she's taken the Kool Aid and has become a good communist, is to the state, and she will do what the state demands. Mrs. Donovan, this document contains your signed statement. It proves that your husband tried to turn your children against the communist state. Is the statement true? Yes. Mom went to the other side. Lieutenant Martin, Comrade Kuchesnov, Comrade Malenko. These documents contain your signed statements. They prove that Comrade Donovan is guilty of deviationism and treason. I want you to tell the court if these statements are correct. I will ask you each in turn. Comrade Kuchesnov. Yes, the statement is true. Comrade Malenko. True. Lieutenant. The statement's true. There's no need to continue this trial. The evidence against the prisoner is overwhelming. I ask now that he be sentenced immediately. I want to see those statements. And maybe I'll have a few words to say in my own defense. The prisoner will step back into the box. There is no need to examine the statements of the witnesses. The prisoner stands condemned by his own words. He has challenged the supreme authority of the state. So again, it's all about what's inside of his head, right? Individualism is inside of his head. He's a problem and, and he's, he's unwilling to admit fault. Right. And so now we see that this is a problem because if he's thinking of himself in an, in an individualistic way, that could spread to other people and eventually the whole collective falls apart. So the state has to protect itself. And because the state has the exclusive monopoly on violence, that's the thing that they're going to have to use. He has questioned its practices and its decisions. And by these actions, he has proved himself to be a dangerous enemy to the proletariat. He must be treated as such, as an ugly remnant of a diseased bourgeois class. He must be eradicated before the contagion can spread. And again, all of this stuff really happened, right? You look at Cambodia, you look at China, you look at the Soviet Union, Cuba, Venezuela, on and on and on and on. Eastern Europe, I mean, just, just, just look at every communist system that has ever existed. And the eradication of people who don't think correctly absolutely happens right in cambodia they killed a third of their people in china they killed over a hundred million chinese people because they must be eradicated so that the collective that's left is strong and uniform and not deviationists comrade donovan you are hereby sentenced to be shot Comrade Donovan. Comrade Donovan, do you know why you're here? 
Second. Yes. Do you have any last requests? Yes. You really need these? I don't think I'll be going anywhere. Nevertheless, I'm afraid they're necessary. Comrade Donovan, you've been convicted of crimes against the supreme communist government. Being an enemy of the state, you must be liquidated. I have been commissioned to carry out your sentence. But no firing squad? I'm afraid not. However, the last favor from the government, you are hereby granted one final chance to confess your crimes. If you wish, a recorder will be summoned to take down your statement. So the question that I get a lot is, why does, why does the communist government care about getting people to confess? If they get people to confess, they can use that confession to take it to everybody else and say, look, we told you there were bad guys out here. We told you there were capitalists lingering out there. That, and then they have somebody to blame, right? When something goes wrong, it's, well, it's all the lingering capitalists that we told you were out there. And look at all the confessions that we've got, right? It always gives them a fall guy. So they're, they're constantly in need of a confession. They constantly want to find enemies so that they have somebody to blame. The statement to make all right, but you can deliver it. You just tell your government that someday its own people are going to get wise to it. Someday there's going to be enough holes in that iron curtain that all of your people will be able to escape to freedom. And they'll be able to build a wall strong enough to hold. Them. My own countrymen once said. It's another interesting thing that he says that they'll never be able to build a wall strong enough to hold your own people in. And, and this, of course, is about five years before the Berlin Wall was actually built. So, again, it's kind of a prophecy that he talks about building walls to keep people inside of communist countries. And that actually happened in Berlin. You can't fool all of the people all of the time. Believe me, you communists can't keep fooling the entire world. I love the way that this is framed where he's talking to us as the audience rather than talking to him because, of course, remember, this is all to convince us that we don't want to be the guy who took things for granted just like Jerry Donovan and ended up in this situation. We've got to be the responsible ones. And so he's talking to us. He's not talking to the communists because, again, he figures the communist bought the, you know, bought the medicine. He's not going to change anyhow. You can't even keep fooling your own people. Because the news about communism is getting around. But it's only another word for slavery. Communism, only another word for slavery. I like that. Don't worry, Jerry. That bullet will never reach you. Because it's time to bring you back from your red nightmare. What you have seen is not entirely fiction. Greater brutality is taking place right now in countries which have been swallowed up by the communist machine. And again, if you want to know what's going on right now in, in a communist country, look at what's happening to the millions of Uyghur people uh, in, in communist China because they're not part of the collective. The communist Chinese are both trying to exterminate them in re-education camps and breed them out of existence. Like, this is a real thing. 2020, look it up. We know that. Jerry is waking. Let's see if his dream has impressed him. Would you mind cereal? Cereal will be fine. So again, we're not taking things for granted anymore, right? He wakes up. He feels great just to be alive. He kisses his wife. He, he's totally in the moment, right? Don't be complacent, Jerry. Also a very common thing between the 50s and the 60s to go from being a cowboy to being a spaceman because that was the transition that happened. Yeah, I guess we can put you in orbit all right. You get a space. Hey, Mom! Mom! Right? Now Dad's very accommodating, right? Let's, let's give the kids what they want because after all, that's what our capitalist system is here for is to take care of our kids and to satisfy their needs and to make them happy. And, and, and so again, Jerry's had this change of heart because he saw what the alternative was. Hi, 
Daddy. Hi, Mr. Donovan. Bill? Uh, if you two kids don't have this car in shape by now, I don't think you ever will. Uh, I'd like to talk some more about that marriage business. You better catch me while I'm in a good mood. Oh, Daddy. <laughs> You've got something to tell you. At this point, I really wanted her, I really I really wanted her to say I'm pregnant, but um, it's the 50s, so I, I I don't think she's actually going to say that. Um, but you know, he's in a good mood. Hey, you want to talk about that marriage thing? Let's talk now because I'm in a great I'm in a great mood. But as soon as as soon as when I watched this, I, I I really wanted to say there's something else we have to tell you. I'm pregnant, but we'll see. Uh, you haven't run off. <laughs> no, that we haven't. Done. Oh, but we have decided to wait. Not five years. So of course, when when dad's in a good place, when when dad's functioning as as you know the head of the uh, the household, right? The kids make good decisions. We have decided to wait. At least I finished my hitch in the service. Until I finished my hitch in the service, because of course, dad's responsibility is to make sure that the next generation, the next patriarch, the next leader of the family, has that good civic responsibility, and he's going to do his term of service, and he's going to do his military hitch, and then he's going to get married afterwards. <laughs> That's a wise decision, Bill. Yes, indeed, I think that's a very wise decision. <laughs> How about some breakfast? Good idea. Gary knows now, so he'll never forget it. Responsibilities are a privilege, an inherent American right, the strength of our nation. The bright hopes of a free world are founded on the dedication of individual Americans. So again, back to individualism, right? It all depends. Our system depends on individuals to resist the slavery of communism. And if you're not going to be responsible and do your civic duty and just assume that someone else is going to do it, then that's the path towards, you know, if someone else is going to decide, then maybe someone else decides that it's going to be communism. People who guarantee freedom by standing ready to fight against aggression, against the communist attempts at world enslavement. Freedom is not hereditary must be earned. Freedom has a price, and its price is vigilance. Its price is responsibility, not only of government, but of every citizen who salutes our flag. Those who serve as a part of our nation's armed might, and those who have served, they guarantee freedom's continued existence. Freedom, no single word in all the languages of mankind has come to mean so much. Freedom to enjoy the simple things of life in the circle of family and friends. Freedom to work at a vocation of our choosing. To vote in open election for the candidate we believe best qualified. To come, to go as we please. Freedom to own property. To enjoy the priceless heritage of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To marry and raise a family with belief in the dignity the human spirit, to study in the field of our choice, to speak our beliefs, to worship God. These freedoms that spell America, they represent a way of life that has become the farthest. Right, you can hear the music in the background, right? This is all good. This is everything's good, right? And again, that's what makes this propaganda is that one side is all bad and one side is all good. And the character journey that Jerry goes through, he starts off as a problem because he's not personally responsible for maintaining his way of life. And now at the end, he is personally responsible. The system will continue. Everyone's happy. The kids will get married eventually after, you know, the next patriarch learns to do his military service, that kind of thing. That's what makes it propaganda, right? It's overly simplistic. It's good versus evil, that kind of thing. But still, it's it's interesting that in this historical time and place that this is how people kind of woke up to what communism is really about. Advancement of mankind on this planet. To prevent communism from consuming the entire free world, there stands but one man. That man is you. to join the army. All right, so that's the end of the film. I hope you enjoyed that one. I hope it was good for you. If it was, leave a like down below. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Subscribing and liking helps the channel out. It tells the YouTube algorithm to, to show this to more people and hopefully get them involved. Uh, I, I hope you're still liking the content. I'm going to still keep making it. Uh, next week, I'm planning to do a Rudolph Valentino film from the 1920s called Blood and Sand. It's about Valentino being a 
bullfighter, which is going to be pretty cool. It's a silent film, of course, because it's from the early 20s. Uh, and, and again, for the foreseeable future, I'm intending to keep doing these. So again, do me a favor, like, subscribe, follow me on Twitter and Facebook and all that kind of stuff. And I'll see you guys in the next episode.